In our last episode, we saw that the Turin shot image had a unique photo negative property which contains depth information and we looked into the other peculiar features of the shot. And the test ran by the Sturb team has revealed that it's not an artistically made image nor is it created by heat or any kind of photography. Despite our modern technology, it still remains impossible to produce an exact replica of the Turin shot image. However, the mystery of the Turin shroud image runs deeper than just the image it bears. The shroud is also marked with intriguing blood stains and other materials that could potentially shed light on the man who is being questioned. The forensic examination done by several doctors and other experts have determined that the man's height is approximately 174 cm. His age has been estimated to be between 30 to 40 years old and his physique is slim and muscular indicating that he likely had a physically demanding lifestyle. And a closer look at the face reveals that there are signs of abrasion on the nose and the cheeks are swollen which is consistent with beating on the face as described in the gospels. On the back image of the shroud There are over hundreds of web marks going all the way to the front and the legs which is consistent with the gospel accounts of Jesus getting scorched before the day of his crucifixion and the web marks are consistent with the double shaped metal of a roman flagrum and you can clearly see it matches the web marks and would penetrate the flesh ripping the nerves and the blood vessels the chemist confirmed the stains were real human blood type ab And surprisingly the antigen does not match any known organism but closer to the human being and it consists of xy chromosomes hemoglobin dna serum rbm and other protein molecules which one might expect in a typical blood if you know the blood is still red in color this is because of the high level of bilirubin in the blood which is due to the excessive damage to the red blood cells as would be the case in a severe injury And the absence of the image beneath the blood stains indicates that the blood stains were there before the image was formed and you can see the cementation of blood but in contrast to the image area you don't see any of this we can see the blood stains all around the head region and this is from a trail of puncture on the scalp in the shape of a wig or a crown and we know from the gospels a crown of thorn was placed on jesus head during the event leading up to his crucifixion And the crown of thorn was not like the circular thing the artist shows. It would rather be a bush of thorn made like a cap or a crown and smash it on his head. And this is unique to Jesus to make him suffer and mock his claim of authority. There are abrasion on the shoulder blade consistent with a heavy object probably due to carrying the cross. Most probably the patibulum alone and not the whole cross as we see in some artwork and tradition. There is a large blood stain at the right pectoral region. Unlike the other blood stain, this one is distinctly from a post-mortem blood flow. So the person was dead when this blood flow occurred, and you can see the blood flowing downwards and appears on the back image. And the puncture wound would have been caused by a sharp penetrating object like a spear. As the Gospel of John records, a Roman soldier pierced a spear to check whether Jesus was dead, and immediately blood and water flowed out. Can you see the halo around the blood stain? This is an ultraviolet fluorescence photograph revealing a serum stain around the blood stain which is completely invisible to the naked eye. It is the watery fluid that accumulates around the heart and the lungs. That's exactly why John records blood and water flowed out. If you look into the paintings of Jesus crucifixion, the nails always pass through the center of the palm. But on the shroud, it's on the wrist, which is medically accurate that can actually withstand the body weight. If you notice the thumbs are not visible this is due to the damage in the median nerve when the nail pierced the wrist which resulted in the flexion of the thumb towards the palm and the projection of the blood on the forearm could not happen with the arms crossed like this but would have happened with the hands upward at a 65 degree angle which is consistent with crucifixion on the back image the soles of the feet are visible which would indicate that the knees were bent because it's nearly impossible to keep the feet in that position without bending the knees this would also indicate that the body was set to rigor mortis when the image was formed if you are unfamiliar with the term rigor mortis it's a stage of death where the body muscles become stiff and hard it usually occurs a few hours after death from john's gospel we know the roman soldiers broke the legs of the other victims to fasten their death but when they came to jesus he was already dead that's why the roman soldiers pierced the spear to verify his death 
and the image also does not show any sign of broken legs. There are blood flowing from the feet area, which corresponds to the nailing of the feet. Other than this blood stains, there is no sign of any decomposition. And the only person we know who has passed through this unique sequence of torture and who has been buried in a shroud is Jesus. Because most of the crucifixion victims was thrown out and eaten by scavengers. As we are talking about medical evidences and blood stains, we need to talk about the Sudarium of Oviedo. The word Sudarium means a towel or a handkerchief. And the Oviedo is a place in North Spain where it is preserved for the last 12 centuries. It is believed to be the face cloth that covered Jesus' face after his crucifixion, which is mentioned in the Gospel of John. It is made up of relatively a poor quality of linen and measures about 84 cm long and 53 cm wide. It has multiple layers of stains, consists of one part of blood and six part of fluid from pleural effusion. This liquid collects in the lungs when a crucified person dies of acidification. The coincidence that the Shroud of Turin and the Sudarium of Oviedo carries the same blood type AB, which is relatively a rare blood group on the planet. There are life blood, that is blood shed in life, and the postmortem blood, which coincides with the shroud. The length of the nose through which the pleural edema fluid came onto the sudarium is exactly the same length as on the shroud. Forensic analysis proves that the blood points originated at the exact same location as on the shroud. For instance, the life blood from the crown of thorn perfectly coincides with the sudarium. It cannot be a mere coincidence that both the cloth carries the same blood type AB, which is a rare one, and matching blood patterns and facial properties. During the X-ray fluorescence analysis of the sudarium, an excess of calcium was detected in the blood stains, particularly around the tip of the nose. This matches the shroud, which had a similar presence of dust in the same area around the nose. And they also found a very low level of strontium, which matches with the type of rock found in Jerusalem where Jesus was crucified. Here is a short clip to demonstrate how the sudarium was wrapped. And this is Dr. Mark Guskin. He is a historian who studied this cloth over decades. That All of this information has come out of the cloth itself. It's the cloth itself that showed us this. So what we know is that it was pinned to the back of the head. It was pinned into the hair, some kind of pins, probably made of bone. Okay. Then it was taken round the front, like this to cover the face. This is the obstacle that the cloth, that the person wrapping the cloth found. Okay, so instead of being able to wrap it all the way around the head, what was done was the cloth was simply doubled back on itself. That's why, that's exactly why we have the sets of symmetrical stains on the cloth. Now this is the position that the cloth would have been left in for those 45 minutes to one hour while the body was on the cross, and exactly the same while it was on the ground. Now, when I spoke about the 5 to 10 minutes of the body being moved towards the tomb, at that moment, the arms were obviously moved down, the body was then carried, we're talking here about the body in a horizontal position, that released all the pressure on the lungs, the chest muscle, which is when all the liquid really started pouring out of the nose. Now somebody, somebody's left hand, because you can see the outlines in the stains, holding this cloth to the nose like that, to absorb all of this liquid. Now, that's when the cloth was then wrapped all the way around the head. It was then, most probably, we've seen this from the crease marks up here, it would have been tied in a knot. When the body reached the tomb, it's very easy like that. You get hold of the knot, you lift it off the head, somebody just put it on the floor, or literally threw it on the floor, one side, which is exactly how John describes the cloth. Folded over, wrapped up, and it was probably just left like that so that the body could be placed in the larger shroud. And the history of the Sudarium is well documented that it was in Palestine until shortly before the year 614 AD. Because of a Persian invasion, the Sudarium was moved and travelled across North Africa and arrived at Spain. And this route was further confirmed by the Poland studies done by Dr. Max Frey. He also took samples from the shroud with a sticky tape before the 1978 Sturp investigation. And he found around 58 species of pollen grains, in which most of them were from Middle East close to the Jerusalem area. The other coincidence is that the sudarium and the shroud share the pollen grains of the same species. However, his work has been called into question due to lack of meteorological information and was interrupted by his death, prompting to criticism. 
Recent research suggests that the pollen grains found on the torrent shroud are probably residues of mixture of palms and ointments that were utilized during the ancient burial customs, which is compatible with the 1st century AD. As previously mentioned, the measurement of the shroud is 14.5 feet long and 3.5 feet wide. But these numbers are a bit weird by modern standards. But when you convert them into Assyrian cubits, which were used at the time of Jesus, it's perfectly 8 cubits long and 2 cubits wide. And there are limestone particles found especially around the feet area. Where the spectral signature of the limestone particles is not consistent with Europe, but perfectly matches that found in Jerusalem area. And we have all these details corresponds well with the Gospel accounts. And we can conclude with great certainty that the man on the shroud could be Jesus. Here's a comment by Dr. Robert Buckling, Professor of Forensic Pathology who has experienced in this field for more than 50 years and examined over 25,000 bodies. Markings on this image are so clear and so medically accurate that the pathological facts which they reflect concerning the suffering and death of the man depicted here are, in my opinion, beyond dispute.